This meeting is being recorded. Awesome. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> And welcome to our manufacturing sector panel. My name is Safa Yunus, and I'm a research associate at Workforce Windsor Essex, and I'm very excited to be facilitating the session this afternoon. Um, a little bit about Workforce Windsor Essex. Uh, we are a community and development board whose mission is to lead regional employment and community planning um, for the development of a strong and sustainable workforce. Um, to learn more about what we do and how we can help you, please visit WorkforceWindsorEssex.com. And while this event is virtual, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather today as the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. We are grateful to work, learn, and live in this area. Um, so to a few uh, housekeeping items, um, for those of you just joining us, um, students or job seekers, please feel free to use the chat feature located at the bottom of the window to engage um, with the session. Uh, you may submit questions at any time throughout, you, throughout the session using the Q&A box um, located there at the bottom. Uh, should you experience any technical difficulties, please feel free to send a message in the chat box and we'll get to that as soon as we can. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that manufacturing has consistently high job, job demands in the region. It's one of the key uh, industries providing employment and supporting the workforce here in Windsor Essex. And so we're very excited um, to open up this space uh, for some speakers with varying degrees of experience in this industry uh, to speak to young students and job seekers. Um, I'd like to first start off by um, introducing um, our speakers today. Um, we have with us Adriana Opio, uh, Ed Bernard, uh, Jillian Chadwick, and David Russello. Um, so Adriana, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you are the Vice President of Classic Tool and Dye Incorporate. Um, I read that you also have a diploma for mechanical engineering from Conestoga College, and you have many years of experience um, in manufacturing. So welcome, Adriano. Um, yes. Um, the first question that I have for you is, how did you find yourself, um, how did you find yourself in this role in manufacturing in this industry? Well, it, um, in my circumstance, it was a, you know, a family uh, business and, um, you know, in, in this particular um, situation, uh, because it was a, we're second generation of uh, family involved in the company. Um, so we've now taken over the business from the first generation. So I pretty much grew up in the industry um, from since I was about uh, 12 years old, pretty much, and then got actively involved when I was about 18 years old and um, just went through the, uh, you know, college education, as you mentioned. And um, uh, it started off just with summer, uh, being a summer student, uh, coming in, you know, after school or in my summertime. Uh, on weekends, Saturdays, whatnot, uh, doing very, very basic job. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Ed also uh, is speaking with us today. Um, he is the research and development manager at Crest Mold Technology Incorporate uh, mm -hmm. since 2010, if that's correct. Um, he uh, has many accomplishments uh, throughout his impressive career, including being the past president of the Windsor Association of Mold Makers. Um, he was also the chair of the Canadian Machine and Tool Dye uh, Mold Federation from 2004 to 2006. Um, these are only a few of the accolades that I've mentioned today. Um, so we're very grateful to have you, Ed, today to speak with us. If you wouldn't mind sharing um, how it is that you found yourself in the role that you are today, like just walk us through your career. Actually, I'm at the end of my career now. So looking back, uh, it's it's been more illustrious than I expected. Uh, I've been born to uh, two immigrant parents, both of which had uh, very little education, no high school education whatsoever. So uh, they enforced on four sons that they had that education was important and follow, you know, doing something that you enjoy because you might end up having to do it all your life. So I was pursuing fine art and uh, that's what I studied at the university. And I remember going around the faculty one day and seeing uh, there were 735 
students enrolled and I figured about 700 of them were better artists than I was. So uh, I had to look for a plan B, uh, looked into what my dad was into, was very much like Adriano, where, uh, you know, it was a family of manufacturers. My dad was in a manufacturing role too. So that was the best fit and uh, looking towards manufacturing. I, I mean, I tried a few other things too. I, I tried uh, agriculture, I tried, um, uh, working in the States, I was doing some, uh, some work in the entertainment field, but uh, I saw the steady work and the long-term uh, opportunity in manufacturing and actually making something. So uh, abandoning the fine arts in the more difficult, enjoyable way, at least that was my perception at the time, I got into manufacturing. And instead of being an artist in, uh, in the art world, I became an artist in the manufacturing world. And and found my joy in uh, in doing what I had to do in order to, to create a, a lucrative uh, lifestyle for myself and then uh, be able to support that lifestyle with a with job. Awesome, That's it's great to hear that, you know, referencing it so as sort of an art form, not many, very many people think of manufacturing um, in that sense, it's kind of a beautiful way to look at it. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Ed. Um, I'll move on to Jillian. Jillian is a, um, let me just get my facts right. You're a graduate of St. Co uh, St. Clair College. Uh, you're ready to write your Red Seal test. I'll leave it to you to introduce yourself and tell us how it is that you found yourself in the role that you are in right now. Uh, so I am a general machinist at Centerline Windsor Limited and I've worked here for six years. And I found myself in the trades through the OYAP program at high school. I took the tech rotation when I was in the ninth grade and it really opened my eyes to what kind of trades are out there that you can take. And I really took a liking to the metal shop program. So I signed up for grade 10 metal shop. I took my class. It was awesome. I really liked it. And at the end of the year, our teacher uh, told us about the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program and how it's an excellent start for children, sorry, not children, but teenagers to get into the trades and learn a hands-on working environment. And it's really, I learned a lot of skills and I have a lot of strengths from being in the OYAP program. And it was a wonderful opportunity for me to get my footing into the trades. And I am now a CNC operator. That is awesome. That is great to hear. Um, and uh, David is also a student in the OYAP program. David, if you'd like to also share with us how you, uh, how you're finding yourself in this role. Sorry, we're just having a bit of issues with the audio. I'll switch over. And then we'll... uh, is that better? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, like I said, I'm David Rushlow. I'm a grade 12 student at General Amherst. I participated inside the OEAP program, and I am a fitter welder at Centerline. Um, as I was going through high school, um, COVID unfortunately took over the world, it seems. And a lot of my class started, I started to struggle in a lot of my classes. And I saw myself uh, moving towards a different career path than what I originally intended. And so I took my grade 11 machining shop and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I was given the opportunity to take part in the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program. Uh, from there, I went to my co op placement at Centerline. And Shortly through there, I was able to find myself in a fitting welding position, which I absolutely love. And I'm hoping to continue my uh, work here at the trade. Working That's the awesome. Building. Great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it seems that Adriano is um, maybe just having some issues with his internet, so we'll get back to him in a little bit. But I was just really curious to hear from you, Ed, about how um, how does a typical day look like for you in your role as a um, as a research and development manager. Yeah, research and development is uh, a passion of mine now. And uh, so we just were awarded last week uh, at Crest Mold a Canada Hood patent, which is an innovative uh, non-invasive uh, respiratory treatment device that uh, was introduced to us during COVID by some hyperbaric uh, Physicians, an invention of theirs that, that we made manufacturable. So, so uh, what Crest is doing is we're continuing to expand our capabilities and, and push the technological envelope because uh, we've found that by 
building more sophisticated, more complicated uh, uh, tooling, we're building the, the tools that build other tools. We're, we're building the uh, equipment that makes other things. So we're into automation, we're injecting four plastics at the same time. Now we're having to stay very current with the, uh, the industry trends and staying ahead of disruptions when you're investing like a million dollars per machine, you have to really be uh, in tune with the future and what the, uh, the trends are so that you're not choosing a wrong path. Just like at one time General Motors was, was looking at hydrogen, uh, propane, like they were looking at six different fuel types. Now everything's going electric. So all that investment and all those different drivetrains, um, it's not lost. I mean, it's part of their, their database, but it's, it hasn't been profitable. So also in a career, it's, it's important to be able to be flexible, to follow trends and to follow what it is you enjoy. Like it's really important to like what you're doing. And a lot of times it's impossible to find a job. Like I tried early in my career to find a job uh, making money, uh, making art. Well, artists aren't recognized until after they die. So I'd find a plan B and, and finding something else that made good money. Well, if you drive around the tool shops in town, you'll see like everyone's driving a new car. Even the apprentices have got brand new vehicles. So looking at the long-term prosperity and the, the, um, the job security and manufacturing, it's very solid. I mean, people on the planet, they've always wanted things. We still want things. If you want things, they have to be made. And so manufacturing and being being uh, familiar with the different manufacturing strategies and methods. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, secure type of uh, career, but it's also something that you have to still remain flexible and in tune with uh, being able to pivot uh, when the industry changes and dis disruptions occur. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, that's very interesting to hear. Um, um, very, <laughs> I didn't really think of it that way. Um, to see, to sort of um, understand it as like, we create the things that create the other things. Um, and um, I'm grateful that you talked about uh, this, the stability that um, working in this um, industry brings. Um, I think Jillian might have something to say about that. You can also talk about that, Jillian, when you tell us about what does, a, what does the day-to-day -day like look like for you in your role? Um, well, as a CNC machinist, I do swing shift. So every two weeks I do day shift or afternoon shift. And when I come in in the morning, I have a car prepared with work that I have to get done. So I take a part, I look at the print, I have to measure it to make sure it's the correct diameter and width and everything. And then I have to load it into my machine. I have to make sure the part is square, it's in the correct position. And then I have to make sure all the tools are loaded into my CNC machine, which is a computer numerical controlled machine. And then I have to make sure that everything is in the proper position. I have to pick it up and then you press a bunch of buttons and you make it run and you have to stand there and just basically make sure it's performing the correct operation it's supposed to be performing. And then when it's done, you take out the part, you deburr it, you, uh, I, I do, excuse me, I have to do a lot of work on my computer. So I'll like, I'll walk back over there make sure the next setup is ready. I put it back in. It's a very fast paced environment. You have to make sure the machine is running constantly. Like if I have a part that's finished in the machine I have to have my next one in there ready to go. So I have to make sure everything is set up and I'm being proficient and I'm being safe and I'm following all the proper rules. And I thoroughly enjoy making, like you take a raw block of steel and you put it in the machine and you turn it into something completely different, you know? I really Really enjoy that and then also with uh, what Ed was talking about about making money in the trades I I don't know when I was in high school I had no money so I signed up for oh yeah and you get a paycheck every week you're at school and well not school but you're at work and you're learning and you're getting credits for school you're getting money for whatever you want to spend it on I personally bought a 2015 Jeep Wrangler with the money I made from oh yeah and that really helped me with my day-to-day -day life and I have a credit card like it's awesome. I don't know, like I was able to pay for my schooling as well. And it's just like everyone else my age was, they were making minimum wages, which is okay, but like it's hard to get shifts sometimes. And I had a constant steady job when I was 16. Like I wasn't worried. It got me prepared for my future. It helped me mature fast because I'm like, hey, I'm here. This is my job. I'm working. And it was an awesome experience for me. I really enjoyed it. Awesome to hear. Yeah. You should tell more of your friends. Like, Join the join the manufacturing sector. Join Oya. <laughs> yeah. I try um, to. I love yeah. the women in the field. Great. 
Um, Adriano, um, I'm not really sure if you can see us. We can't really see your screen. So we might come back to you um, just in a little bit. Um, David, would you mind telling us uh, what, uh, what the day-to-day -day looks like in your role? Again, I think we're having issues with sound. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I think we can hear you now, if you'd like to. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're good? Right. Yes. So my day-to-day -day, uh, would look like I come in, um, I have usually a house call, and I go and I take out a meeting, and th this is just all the work that I'd have to get done during the day. Sorry, just one second. All right, go ahead. Oh, sorry, just a second. We're having issues again with the audio. I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> Can, can everybody hear Ed? No? Oh. Yeah, I mean, this sort of comes with the territory of doing it virtually, right? Um, thanks, COVID. <laughs> no, no. I will. Oh, yeah, it's back in again, but it keeps cutting in, but Okay. Adriano, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. I just think okay. the screen is gray on my end. I'm not sure if anyone else can see. Yeah, I'm not too sure why the screen is. Our one internet connection just died, so I had to switch internet connections. Okay. So I can speak fine. Um, the video is just not working with me right now. So I'm using a different uh, computer, but I can answer any questions or um, if you want to... Uh, ask away I can hear and see you guys. Yes, definitely. So my question to you would be, what does the day-to-day -day role look like for you? What does a day-to-day -day in your job look like for you? So in my, um, in my case, uh, we're a, a medium-sized company. So we're, uh, let's say, between 30 and 40 employees. And when it comes to uh, um, a company of our size, pretty much everybody has to wear a few hats. There's um, even though that we'll have tool makers, the tool makers will often, you know, do some repairs around the shop or we'll jump on a CNC and some CNC operators will, um, you know, when, when it gets slow on the CNC side, they will, um, you know, offer some assistance in the grinding room or assembly room or whatnot. So um, in my case, what I have to do is I have to pretty much oversee and do everything. Um, so it's kind of a, um, wearing multiple hats at the same time, putting out a lot of fires. Um, you know, pretty much uh, oversee everything, get my hands into whatever needs to be done or addressed, uh, put out emergencies, things like that. It's a pretty fast paced environment. So um, everything from sales to uh, machine repair to um, design to quoting. Um, in my case, I, I, I pretty much do everything. And um, most people in, in my situation are you know, have, have the same kind of environment, um, pretty much do the same thing. So in our industry, everybody's got to kind of put their hands into multiple roles. I see. Um, so I'm, Adriana I'm sure. makes a very, sorry, I was just going to comment on Adriano's uh, notes there that um, it is very important to be able to have a lot of different skill sets within the sector that you choose. Uh, the more skill sets, the more machines you can operate, the more programs you can run, the more valuable you are, and therefore the, the higher wage you can earn. So it's very important to, uh, the hearing from uh, Jillian there, uh, it was kind of interesting to me to, to think back on those days when you're trying to be as valuable to the company as possible because you want that job security. But the more risks you take as far as learning and the, the more you put yourself out there, the more you're going to be the become the go-to person in the department, and uh, and that's when you really start to climb the ladder, which I expect is everyone's goal. Right. Um, so I'm not sure if you can speak to this, but what do you what what specific um, skill sets would you recommend um, that those who are considering joining the manufacturing sector should pick up along the way or have prior to? 
if I can grab that one, Adriano's company, Classic, they build uh, dyes, metal forming dyes. Crest Mold, where I work, we, we produce plastic forming tooling. So we use a lot of the same equipment and where both companies are considered advanced manufacturers. So if you're an advanced manufacturer producing aerospace components or military parts or nuclear uh, uh, assemblies, uh, you're using a lot of the same equipment. So right now there's a lot of buzz in the industry. You hear it throughout all the sectors about digital twinning, digitization, um, everything is being transformed into a digital world. And once it's in the digital world, then we can manipulate it on our computers. Then we can, we can change things, we can simulate things, we can create virtual environments. Uh, Windsor is, has got the, uh, the virtual cave. I don't know if uh, everyone on the, the uh, call here is aware of that, but we have a very rare uh, asset here in the area where we can go into this cave and we can virtually walk right through the components that we're designing. We can, uh, we can enter into these simu uh, simulated environments. And at Crest, we simulate just about everything before we make it, we simulate it virtually. So having that kind of a skill set, being able to, um, to uh, transform things into a digital world so that you can then manipulate them, that's a huge skill set for any manufacturer. Awesome. So lots of tech skills and sort of technical literacy. The, uh, as Jillian was pointing out, you know, the CNC, the Computer Numerical Controlled Machines, um, that's the way all machines are going. It won't be very long. Fortunately, in uh, Adriano's and my own case, uh, we were in an industry where digitization occurred very early on. So while the rest of manufacturing is, is catching up, our industry is, is way ahead. Like we're injecting four different plastics simultaneously Parts are coming out of the mold now already assembled. So the owner of Crest has got a saying that no labor, the cost for no labor is cheaper than the cost for cheap labor. So we're making things that are fully automated so that there's no labor afterwards to, uh, to assemble them. Awesome, it's very interesting. Um, David, um, welcome back. Yep, thank you, we got it going. Awesome. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, that's no problem. It's just part of the territory, right? That's what it's like working virtually these days. Um, I, my question uh, to David before you cut out, um, I believe was, um, what does a typical day look like for you in the, in the sector? I'm very curious because you are an OYAP student and I just wanted to hear more about what that looked like for you. Hello? Hello. Oh yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Sorry, it's just, I had to switch over to an older computer. It's not going great. That's um, okay. We have that happen. Anyways. Also. No, I can't. Okay. Um, so anyways, as an OEAP student, my uh, my day-to-day -day would look exactly like any other uh, person inside the companies would look like. Um, specific to my role. Um, I, I go in, I make sure my machine's ready to go. I would get my work for the day. Um, specifically being a fitter welder, I do a lot of fitting. Um, it's almost like playing with adult Legos where you're building big metal structures. Um, it's, it's a lot, it's very, it's very interesting. Get your brain going. You gotta, you gotta make sure you're doing a lot of math. You gotta make sure everything that you're doing is precise. Um, and then once everything is built, you take your time to set your machine and you weld it together. And then you send it off on its way to wherever it needs to go next, whether it be machining towards Jillian or it be um, towards paint to be painted to go out to the build groups. Awesome. Sounds like you have very productive days. That's great to hear. Um, we have questions in the chat. I just like to remind everybody that if you do have any questions, just let us know. Um, one of the questions posed was for the OEAP students. Um, how does it feel like to make a career decision while you're still in high school? As Jillian sort of explained, she um, there are so many perks with that, you know, financial um, 
stability that comes with making this career choice. But is there any other per like perspectives that you can give us about what it was like to make that career choice fairly early on? Um, it was a little stressful because I'm like, what if 10 years down the road, I don't want to do this. And I kind of regret not taking the extra classes you have to take in high school to get into a university program. But like, for me, I am not like me to sit in a classroom and take like biology or something, you know, like I'd rather have a hands-on learning and like be doing everything in front of me at my own machine. So I really enjoy that. But also it's just like, once you start in the trades, you're not stuck. You can't like, you can continuously do progress and move to different areas. Like if you start the OYAP program, you can go and be a general machinist or take the course like David did. He jumped in and decided to be a welder. And there's other people who choose to be electrical uh, apprentices or even millwrights. And yeah, I could still keep going if I wanted to. Like one day in the future, I would maybe like to be a manufacturing teacher to help encourage more women to get into the trades. But as it is right now, I am enjoying where I am as a CNC machinist. That's amazing to hear. That's so lovely to hear, Jillian. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so going back to um, what David was saying about uh, mathematics and sort of being precise, um, would you say that that's a necessary like that's a necessary skill for your role? What other what other skills would you say are absolutely necessary for um, your role? Sorry, I feel like we're having more internet troubles. Uh, who's that addressed to? Is that to Jillian? That was to David, but um, oh. if he's having a bit of issues. Hello? I'm... Yes, hello. I'm here. Sorry, it, my computer froze again. That's all right. Very old computer. Um, so the question was where I, uh, where I, you know, I to it. well, so making the choice um, was not necessarily an easy one, especially like so early on in high school. But after getting out into the workforce and into the trades, I realized that you are not just stuck to your defined role where you are, um, especially with how big the manufacturing sector is. If you choose to go back to school to be an engineer, or if you don't like your trade, you can go and proceed through other trades. So that you have lots of options on where you can expand to. And the skills that you learn in each individual trade doesn't necessarily mean that those are skills specific to that. Like for example, machining, you learn a lot about measurements, which from my experience in machining, when I first started my OYAP to welding, I can assure you that a lot of those skills were transferable. And I imagine just as such, those skills would also be transferable out into being a millwright or an electrician in some sort of way. So just because you make a choice now doesn't necessarily mean you're stuck with that choice. Awesome. So what I'm hearing is there's lots of flexibility once you join this sector um, straight through OYAP or even at different points as Ed and uh, Adriana were saying earlier. Um, that's great to hear. Uh, Adriana or Ed, did you have any other um, sort yeah. of input onto these? I'd like to add on to that. Actually, that's a very good point what David had mentioned because the one big thing about our industry is we, we tend to promote within. So, um, and, and again, repeating what David said is that you're not limited to a um, specific role in our industry, typically. Um, as, a, as a company, and, and I think Ed would agree with this, is that we always try to find good employees and we always try to um, increase the, um, uh, you know, the, the employee, uh, not just the employee count, but also the employee, employee quality. And, and again, to bring on what Ed said is that um, the more um, things that an employee can do, uh, the better suited it is uh, that he can or she can, you know, be within the company. And um, the more ability that that individual has to move around the company to better themselves and better the company as a whole. So um, you have to start off on, on ground level. That's that's straightforward. Everybody has to understand that you're not going to gra graduate out of out of any program and all of a sudden make you know top wage and and um, uh, you know in any company. But if you can get the basic knowledge out of school and have the uh, incentive to to work hard, um, any company is is going to be more than willing to bring you up the ladder. Um, you know, it, it's just a, what we strive for is, is a good employee um, that's willing to actually, uh, you know, 
be better for the company, uh, to train within the company. And, and again, we promote within. Um, and um, the more you can do, the, the better. That's, that's what it comes down to. Um, the training in school is, is to get your foot in the door and everything else is, is pretty much training within the company. We also send people out for training, for specialized training, um, but uh, the basic elements have to be there uh, in, in school, in math and, and science, um, uh, language skills, uh, communication skills. Um, th those are the, the, the key uh, skill sets that we look for. Awesome, thank you for highlighting those skill sets. That was gonna be one of my questions. Um, Ed, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add on, but I do have a question from um, one of the attendees. Um, the question is, what advice do you have for parents that are wary of encouraging their children to enter a sector that has had downturns? So um, before I pass that on, I would just like to say that um, Windsor, when Workforce Windsor Essex um, has uh, monthly job demand reports and uh, manufacturing has consistently been at the top of that. So there is constant job demand for uh, manufacturing in the region. But I would just like to pass that question off to maybe, um, well, anyone here, if you would have an, a response to that the fact that this um, sector has had downturns? Well, I know- Jump in on that one. Uh, yeah. First, yeah, I'd also I... like to build on what Adriana was saying that uh, people are promoted from internally. So I started out sweeping a floor myself in a, in a mold shop. So, uh, and then, you know, I'd say probably 30 years into my career, was in Europe speaking at international conferences on, on advanced manufacturing. So it depends on what uh, turns your crank, so to speak. And if, if you enjoy designing, you still got to start out sweeping the floor. And when you get on a CNC machine and you start to understand what's going on, like keep your eyes open, look what everyone else is doing, learn how to do everyone's job. And the best designers of any components are coming from the shop floor where the guys have worked on the machines. So they're designing components that are more easily machined. So obviously they're gonna be a lower cost. If they perform the same, they're easier to machine and they're a lower cost, you've got a winner. So looking to promote yourself, if you, if you love your CNC machine and you love coming in every day and doing your job, that's great. If you wanna climb the ladder, you can continue to go up the ladder and these skill sets are not just transferable from one shop to another in a downturn. You can take this skill set anywhere in the world. Like these advanced manufacturing jobs are in demand across the entire planet. It's not like India has got a whole bunch of advanced manufacturers and all we have to do is hire them in Canada. The entire world is looking for these kind of skill sets. So yeah, there are downturns, um, but that's more dependent on the company that you work for than the actual sector because we're building for three years into the future so there's no downturns in our business uh, we haven't had a downturn I don't think we've had a layoff even through the slow times uh, we have I've only been laid off once in my entire life in this sector and that was uh, when the entire planet was shut down so so if you've got a skill set that you can move from machine to machine within a shop or from shop to shop or from country to country, that's job security, uh, even if there are upswings and downturns in the, the overall industry. Most industries have that. Even, I mean, during this pandemic, even the surgeons have had a downturn because they can't do elective surgeries. That's right. That's right. Uh, thank you for letting us know that these skills are, once you acquire them, transferable. And um, as you know, all the other speakers were saying very like this is a very flexible sector, so you can move within it um, very like fluidly. Um, Adriana, did you have anything else to comment on that? Yeah, to uh, answer that question, uh, exactly what Ed said too. The more uh, that a, a person comes into this trade with the um, willingness to uh, expand their knowledge, um, not just, I mean, if you're just a specific machine operator and, you know, a drill press operator and that's all you're willing to do, uh, yeah, then there's a potential that in a downturn, uh, things might get up and down, just like every other uh, trade. But if you come into this trade with um, the willingness to expand your knowledge and to uh, really um, uh, learn the trade as a whole, um, there, there is no downturn. Um, to put an example, uh, the last time we did any layoffs was back in 2008 
we laid off one person in 2008. During COVID times, uh, we were actively looking for people and um, for any high-end tool makers uh, in the tool and die industry, our ads never go down. We have never taken down our ad uh, to try to find a good experienced tool and die makers uh, and apprentices for that matter. Um, so to answer the question, uh, as far as um, a sector with downturns, well, I, I'm not going to say it's downturns because if you're um, uh, a good tool maker and willing to, um, uh, you know, get into the trade with uh, with both feet, um, there's very little chance you'll get laid off uh, in, in this industry. Awesome, that's great to hear. That's good news for um, our young uh, participants, Jillian and David. You know, job security in this sector, and also for those who are interested in learning more about this sector. That's very good to hear. Um, I had another question. Um, this one is directed towards Jillian. First of all, happy International Women's Day, Jillian, um, and to the other participants and attendees. Um, Jillian, I had a question. Um, do you have any advice for other young women considering or entering into the manufacturing industry through programs such as OYAP or just um, in general? I would say you have to be confident and strong and be your best. Like I know everyone has to try and prove themselves at a job and that is okay. But sometimes you have to try a little extra hard, which is all right. But sometimes people are a little skeptical when they do see a woman on the floor because it's not as common as it is. But um, honestly, just go in and prove that you can do it because you can. Like just because you're a woman doesn't mean that you can't do what a man can do. Everyone is exceptional and everyone can perform what they set their mind to. So if you want to take a step and try to be in the trades, go for it. You're not gonna know if you can do it unless you try. And it is a wonderful experience to try. And I do recommend to any woman who is considering joining the trades to just try it. It is amazing. And we love to see other women out there doing, a, it's amazing, just do the trades, it's great. <laughs> That's honestly so wonderful to hear your your excitement and passion about uh, about the trades, Jillian. That's thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I had uh, some other questions. I'll start with David. Um, David, if you can hear me, just let let me know. Um, as an OYAP student, yeah, um, along awesome, along with Jillian, I was wondering if you what advice would you give to somebody considering um, considering the sector. Um, Given your um, given your history, I'd say anybody who's even remotely looking into getting into the trades and specifically manufacturing. No, please. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right. I have. I have to Okay. So anybody uh, looking to get into the manufacturing sector, um, I'd suggest taking OYAP. Um, you'll learn so much and. The most important thing I found is you'll meet so many um, experienced individuals, but most importantly, you will get those connections with inside the trade. So you'll be able to have that, like we talked about earlier, flexibility. You'll be able to learn about all the different types of trades within the sector, and you'll be able to branch out. And the more people you know, especially early on in your career, it's a lot about who you, or who you know rather than what you know. And then as you get later on, it's more about what you know and so who you know, because then you can branch off even more effectively throughout your trade. But I'd, I'd say main thing, if you're considering it, get in, work hard, prove yourself, expand your horizons, network with people, and just be ready to succeed throughout your career. Awesome. Uh, Ed, do you have anything to add to that? I'll jump in with a little existentialism. Um, if, if you're enjoying what you're doing, then it's not like work. And I think that that's very important. And, and being the old guy here, uh, I really want to impress the young, uh, you know, workers that you have to enjoy what you're doing. And, and it's a lot of times hard to find a job that you love. It's easier to transform the job you love into something you like doing. So it's a lot about your attitude, your approach. And there's a real satisfaction in producing something. If, if you create something and you can stand back and go, I made that, there's a, that's better than money in a lot of cases. I mean, it doesn't put you know, peanut butter on your bread, but it's still a, a really good 
feeling and it's it's a good thing to get out of your your effort out of your work so make sure that you find something that you can grow into and then really expand it and transform it into something you enjoy doing you can you can make it more fun and make it more productive at the same time and your boss will be happy and you'll be happier and everyone around you will be happier that's great advice um, Adriano, did you have something else to add to that also? Um, no, I think you guys have pretty much hit it up, um, uh, you know, uh, across the board. Um, that's exactly what, you know, just to take on what Ed was saying. Um, it, it's all about liking what you do, because if you come into this trade and, or you come into any shop and you have to, uh, come in and say, um, you know, geez, I hate, you know, I got to wake up, I got to go to work and, this, you know, this sucks. This is not the right thing for you. You know, you have to find something that you really like and really enjoy. And it just, it, it's like the big wheel. You know, if you enjoy your work, you do better at it. If you, uh, and you'll, you'll move further along. Um, so it, it, it's a matter of like any job, you have to enjoy what you do. And that's why, that's why this program is a great starter because um, you can see if, if, you know, working on machinery or, or building tools or whatnot, you can see if that's up your alley, if, if you enjoy doing it. If you do, you can go very far. Um, but again, if it's, if it's some people like uh, working with their hands and building things, some people like, uh, uh, you know, counting numbers and being accountant and, and whatnot. It's all about, uh, you know, what, what your uh, enjoyment is. Um, but I highly recommend if, if you like working with your hands, uh, if you like uh, building things and seeing the full, um, uh, you know, from design to finish type aspect, um, this is the trade. This is the right thing to do. And, and in Windsor, we're in the, uh, you know, Southern Ontario in the Mecca of uh, tool and the tooling industry, tool and die automotive industry. So it's the right place to be, definitely. Yes, and I'm, I'm very happy that you've um, that you've discussed passion and um, wanting to actually show up for work. And it's great that we have OEAP students and um, those who actually have experience of you know dipping your foot in, seeing if, if this is what you like. But we do have a question from uh, one of the attendees um, about just as a, as adult job seekers um, for mature job seekers. Like, what is the best way to get involved in the industry without going back to school for many years? Is there is there any suggestions that you may have for um, this person? Um, well, here at Centerline, I'll jump you... in on that one. Oh, oops, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jillian. Oh, sorry. Um, just from my experience at Centerline, I've met a lot of people coming into the trades who had zero experience. And here at the company I work at, they take the time and they teach you the necessary skills you need to complete the job. And they like they work with you every day and you will pick up on what you're learning. They teach you everything. They show you every like why you're doing it just the way you're doing it. And then like every day you progress and you learn the skills in the trade that you're signing up for. So even if you don't know like how to turn screwdriver left to right or whatever, you know, like it's just a basic thing. They will show you, they'll take your time and like, they don't mind if you're new. They want to dedicate their time to you because you're going to be a dedicated employee. Right. Ed, Let Ed, me comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what Jillian's saying is, is absolutely true. You've got to have that right attitude. And if you want to learn and you want to improve yourself, then, uh, your entire environment will be better for you that way too. And, and your, your work environment's gonna be better. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, would it be possible, say, for someone to walk in with little experience to one of your shops, Adriana or Ed, um, and ask to be um, sort of trained or hired as an adult job seeker? Is that a possibility or is... Um, so that's that's a very good question. I can see that question come up here. Um, there's it really depends. Uh, what it comes down to is if that uh, individual has certain trade skills from previous jobs or uh, you know uh, skill sets that we can uh, you know draw a parallel to to what we do here, um, then it's possible. It's definitely possible. So 
Uh, let's see um, what, what I found, which is really interesting, and I don't know if you can agree with me on this, but we found that, uh, uh, and I hope this isn't, uh, you know, like a, a, an overall kind of, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, speaking for everybody, but farmers, <laughs> for some reason, seem to be, work out to be the best tool makers. Uh, and, and I was always wondering why, uh, and it's because on the farm, uh, you know, you do what you got to do to get the job done. Um, if a tractor is broken, you go out there, you fix it. Um, you know, you have to do your own maintenance. You have to uh, look after everything. It's bright and early in the morning and, and you're working long hours. So, uh, you know, it really is a matter of finding the right uh, the person that has the right skill sets or maybe uh, that has a previous um, uh, work environment, uh, call it a car, a car mechanic uh, or somebody in the automotive trade or in any kind of mechanical trade um, that we could, you know, somehow uh, divert those to or, or, or kind of adjust those to our industry. It, it's, it's very easy to do that. Um, now, if you're you know, doing something completely different. If you're a chef and you want to start getting into the trades, it's a lot more difficult. It's not impossible, but um, I would highly recommend some taking some courses, um, basic courses, uh, just machine operation or CNC, um, get into the, uh, you know, G code programming or the basic maybe master cam programs. And you need that to get your foot in the door, really. Um, it doesn't have to be years of, of um, understanding, but you need the basic, um, uh, also the basic language. So if we say, you know, this cutting edge is, is dull, it needs to be resharpened to 10 thou, or this has to be ground square within five thou, you know, you have to be able to understand that language. Uh, so this is very important. This is one thing that um, uh, the basic um, knowledge uh, has to be there before, you know, we look at hiring somebody as a full-time position. I see. Um, Ed, is that something that you would also agree with? I do. And uh, I, I like to say that we're all born knowing nothing. So to think that uh, you could go into advanced manufacturing as a side gig, absolutely. And, and especially if you're the type of person who is a little bit maybe overly cautious, um, don't want to jump into something with both your feet. Getting into advanced manufacturing, I mean, there's, we wouldn't have believed this 10 years ago, but people are buying, you know, 3D printers for their homes now. And uh, that is a form of advanced manufacturing too. It's additive manufacturing and, and people are doing like CAD in their, in their homes as a hobby. So to advance from writing these G codes and, and really uh, for, for anyone who's listening to this, a, a G code or an M code, that's the beginning of, of uh, being able to create algorithms. A series of codes is an algorithm. And we hear a lot of work about word, uh, words like artificial intelligence or uh, algorithms. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of machine learning or, uh, you know, computers are, are now teaching other computers and creating, they're asking questions of each other that humans wouldn't think to ask. So there's a lot of this advanced technology that's being adopted by advanced manufacturing that if you're a, I don't know what this person does for their regular job if they're a pharmacist or you know if they're a, a, a main a, a lawn maintenance person it doesn't really matter if you're into the digital world everything even lawn maintenance is transforming to a digital world it's being digitally twinned so that you can use a CNC program to custom cut your lawn without using any more gasoline in five years, there won't be any more gas lawnmowers without using any electricity unnecessarily. So this, this idea, it is a new notion to, to get into this as a side gig, uh, but it's not impossible at all. But Adriano's right. If you're, if you're a, a dentist getting into um, advanced manufacturing, it's going to be easier than if you're an accountant, but either one could do it. That's great. <clears throat> so what I'm so what I'm understanding is that um, it's not impossible. It is very um, sort of accessible if you really put your mind to it and come to it with the with similar skill sets, um, which is great to hear, uh, especially for those older job seekers. Um, 
in the audience and those who will be watching later on. Just really quickly, we are a little bit short on time. I just had maybe one question left for each of you to respond within a minute or so. Um, what has been the biggest surprise for you working in the manufacturing industry? Um, David, I would like to start with you. Um, I'd say I'd say probably the biggest surprise to me um, was just just as many it's just as how many like-minded people I was able to meet, um, especially coming out of COVID, where there was not to you didn't get the opportunity to socialize a lot of different people. Um, it really it really showed me that there's a lot more people that are like-minded, a lot more hardworking individuals. And like I said, with networking, it allow, it allows you to just expand your horizons. And, you, and I was able to learn so much about not only manufacturing, but also different types of construction and different fields that I can expand myself into from just, just where, just where I've been. And that's also on top of like all the different skills you learn just from being in the trades over the last year, I've learned more over the last year doing OEAP than I think I've ever learned in school. Awesome. That's so great to hear David. Uh, Jillian, do you have any comments about that? Like what has been your biggest surprise working in the trades or in manufacturing in Windsor? Um, for me, the biggest surprise is like the longer I am in the trades, the easier the information comes to me. Like sometimes I'll be setting something up in my machine. It's a little difficult. I'm just like, before I even blink, it's done. Like if my hands already did it, like my, it's just like muscle to mind memory, I guess. Like I'm just so used to doing it that it's just, I'm, I don't know. Like it just comes to me. Like it's, it's great. And I love sometimes watching myself like achieve these great machining feats. I'm just looking at it. I'm like, I did that. Like, look at what I was able to do. And six years ago, I had no idea how to even set this up, you know? So I think that just for me, seeing how far I come is just so surprising because I never thought of how much I could grow as a person in the trades. And it's, it's been an amazing experience. That's incredible to hear. That sounds very rewarding also. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I love family. About what you do. Awesome. Uh, Adriano, how about yourself? I know that you, in your position, you've, I'm sure you've seen many things. Um, what has been one of the biggest surprises for you in working in this industry? Well, I've, I've been doing this a little while, so really there's not many surprises uh, because we're used to seeing a lot of different things over the years. Um, I'd say a, a couple of surprises would be um, how recently uh, a lot of the jobs, and again, this is due to COVID. I know COVID is not the, uh, the, the nicest thing in the world, but what, what it has happened is it's allowed that uh, a lot of the work has come back to North America. So whereas uh, a lot, you know, let's call it a certain percentage would be uh, shipped overseas to low cost countries, we have seen a, a really large um, turnaround of that work now being done in North America. So there's more opportunity now than ever to get on board with the trades and to really um, hit the ground running because it's all coming back. Um, so it, it, I didn't realize how quickly I knew um, that that might be kind of a slow transaction, but it's it's been instantaneous where um, it, it's gone from, okay, we need to source 10% uh, to low cost crunch, country to now we're ending it. It's all going to stay in North America and that's the way it's going to be. And it, it was almost overnight that I've seen it happen. Um, that's one big surprise. Another big, uh, a big uh, overturn was um, the, the, how quickly advanced technology has been incorporated into our trade. Um, we're doing things now in our company that um, some of the big technical companies haven't even dreamed of. Uh, we're doing virtualization technology. Um, so our systems are no longer being uh, physical systems on the floor. They're being virtualized now from servers. So, I mean, th there's, there's so much advancement that's happening so quickly. It seems that as soon as something comes to market, it's our industry that really grasps that and uh, is a, it, it tries to utilize it because with our industry, again, we're, we're as, as efficient or more efficient than any other industry out there. So we have to utilize the, those technologies. Those would probably be the biggest surprises for me. Wow, definitely wonderful um, silver linings there for the uh, COVID situation, especially in terms of this industry. As you've described, it's um, very progressive in terms of technology and currently accepting lots of people. So those of you who are interested in listening and please keep that in mind. Um, Ed, um, any surprises? You by far out of all of the panelists have the lengthiest career. Um, so I'm curious to yeah, hear I what- um, <laughs> 
for sure. But the, the, uh, the surprises that, that were really special for me me was how many doors were opened by uh, a manufacturing sector. Now, I mentioned that I had taken fine arts at the University of Windsor. I'd taken some courses at St. Clair. Uh, but really, to think that myself, a guy with a high school education, because that's all that's relative to my career, was able to achieve the levels of, uh, of distinguishment and, uh, and opportunity that I was able to. And I would... Uh, I would say that uh, striving for perfection in whatever your job is and, and always trying to learn more about your job, again, if, if it's cake decorating or whatever it is, it'll put you in an opportunity to begin to volunteer and mentor others. And by doing that, um, it takes very little of your own time and it, it's self-rewarding in itself. It's part of why I'm here uh, today. But what it does is it, it also introduces you to like-minded people and by volunteering, even if you're a, a young worker, by getting involved in an industry association or getting on the newsletter of your shop or something like that, you'll get introduced to other people of higher levels than yourself. And these are also people who are willing to give of themselves into these volunteer positions. So you'll be dealing with other you know, good-hearted people and it's amazing how any industry, advanced manufacturing being one of them, uh, can open up the world to you and, uh, and really make your job that much more satisfying so you don't have to regret when the alarm clock goes off in the morning. <laughs> awesome. What a wonderful note to end on. Um, we really appreciate you uh, sharing that with us, Ed, and we really appreciate all of our panelists coming in today and speaking to us about their experiences um, in this industry and in this sector. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the manufacturing sector, uh, you can read more at workforcewindsoressex.com slash career dash library. Um, just for the attendees, we have a quick survey. Uh, as soon as you um, exit out of this chat, out of this session, um, a survey will pop up. It's only two questions. Uh, we would love to hear back from you. And to our panelists, I have, a, I have one for you also. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, please don't forget to check out our speaker event highlighting careers in healthcare, transportation, and entrepreneurship. And also keep in mind that we have a few more events coming up this week. Um, if you'd like to learn more about that, please feel free to reach out. Um, thank you all for attending today and um, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome, Jillian. See you. Have Bye, David. Day. Have a great day. Happy International Women's Day. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. To you too, Jillian.